So our first session is our keynote, um, and we have two wonderful speakers who we're very excited to hear about. Um, they'll be talking about artificial intelligence from a First Nations perspective. Um, so we have Dr. Karaitiana Tayuru. Um, Dr. Tayuru is a leading authority and a highly accomplished visionary Maori technology ethicist specializing in Maori rights with AI, Maori data sovereignty, and government uh, governance with emerging digital technologies and biological sciences. Uh, he brings extensive expertise in Maori traditional knowledge and advocacy for digital Maori rights and data sovereignty and a profound understanding of the intersection between Maori knowledge and emerging technologies. And then we also have Maggie Walter with us today. Um, Maggie Walter is a Palawa, um, a member of the Tasmanian Briggs family and distinguished professor of sociology emerita at the University of Tasmania and is the author of six books and over 100 journal articles, research chapters in the fields of Indigenous sociology and Indigenous data sovereignty. Recent publications include Indigenous data sovereignty and policy, uh, Maggie is also a founding member of the Australian Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective, um, which I'm not going to butcher the name of, um, and executive member of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. So thank you. You just wanted us to start speaking, do you, Ella? <laughs> yes, go for it. I no. think you are going to go first, Maggie. If that's no worries. Right. So uh, yeah, Palingana, everybody who's online, I can't see you, but I can see uh, the number 100 there, which is um, is reassuring that I'm not just sitting at my <laughs> at my kitchen bench <laughs> and wasting a beautiful Tasmanian uh, Lutruwita. It's absolutely lovely here in Lutruwita today, absolutely crystal clear skies. So in doing so, I um, I want to pay my respects. I am here on in Lutruwita, Tasmania, on the land of the Mufanina people, I pay my respects to the Muhanina, none of whom survived colonisation. Uh, in fact, uh, all of us here in uh, in Lutruwita, we come from just nine women who managed to survive colonisation by being kidnapped by sealers, and their children um, were raised in in a way from the the um, concentration camps at Waibalina that killed everybody else. So I. Pay my respects to my ancestors and to the ancestors of everybody on whose country you are today. So I, I haven't, I could give you slides, but I just thought because it's a panel, I just talk for about um, five or so minutes uh, and talk about libraries. I'm not a librarian, I'm a sociologist, but just talk about a bit about data sovereignty and how that is changing the way all sorts of records are undertaken. So just as a, a central point, for those of you who haven't really, data, Indigenous data sovereignty is a movement, an advocacy movement, but it also is a, a field of scholarship. Uh, and yes, do, please put questions up, but we can answer them as we go. But you need to know very clearly that Indigenous data sovereignty has a set meaning. It's a, got a defined meaning, and it is about the rights of Indigenous peoples. Uh, tick with that word rights. It is about our rights to own control and about all aspects of the data infrastructure in data that relate to us. And when we talk about data, Indigenous data also has a, a meeting, a meaning that is agreed by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, who has members um, from Australia, Canada, the US, Mexico, uh, Aotearoa, uh, Norway and Sweden, that Indigenous data are information in any format that relates to Indigenous peoples, our lands, our waters, our territories, our knowledges, systems, our culture, our past. Anything that relates to us is Indigenous data. So if you can keep those two definitions in mind, and Karatana might have a, a different um, slight um, piece on it, but the reason I really emphasise that is that we have been making globally and in Australia some quite um, strong progress in bringing Indigenous data sovereignty to all sorts of data collections everywhere. And we are very grateful for all those groups that work with us on this and have made an uh, amazing progress, but we have also witnessed quite a number of attempts to actually change 
what Indigenous data sovereignty is. So a group will say, yes, we'll do more about Indigenous data, but when we say Indigenous data sovereignty, we actually mean we'll have a working group. And we say, no, um, what you're doing is great and we support you because it's better than what we had before, but unless it is about the rights of Indigenous people to data, then it's not Indigenous data sovereignty. Indigenous data sovereignty also must be Indigenous-led and it must be Indigenous-led right from the beginning. So if data are already held, and we are no talking with libraries today, we're mostly talking about data that are held within, um, within institutions. We can't control those data, but we do need institutions such as libraries to come on board to make sure that you have very good Indigenous data governance. And that means make sure that Indigenous leaders in your field have the decision making around how those data are used. So I might stop there and hand over to my other panel uh, person and because we might go through a back and forth because it gets really boring listening to the one voice for too long. Uh, thanks, Maggie. And just um yeah so I'm over in New Zealand so I just I just want to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of Australia. And that we that um, as New Zealand Maori we have very similar um, um, histories of colonisation and oppression, and that's also a really great honour to be able to um, share some thoughts with you. So uh, and likewise, I don't have slides. Uh, we, we thought it was better to just have a, a conversation. So I, I just want to carry on from what um, Maggie was talking about with Indigenous data sovereignty. So in New Zealand, we, we, we're I believe we're probably the um, only Indigenous peoples who are unique to each other. In the fact that we have constitutional um, obligation, or the New Zealand government has constitutional obligations to recognise Maori data and to recognise um, data sovereignty, uh, so that's primarily through um, a, a treaty uh, called the Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tiriti of Waitangi. So within that treaty, um, Maori can have um, co-governance and can have sovereignty over anything that they consider to be a treasure or what we call a taonga. Um, so in 2018, we um, there was a number of claimants took the New Zealand um, government um, to the tribunal, um, the Waitangi Tribunal, which oversees that constitutional document. And we argued that the New Zealand government was in breach of the constitution by not recognising Māori data sovereignty. So just um, at the end, uh, yeah, in conclusion, we um, persuaded the tribunal to agree with us, and that forced the government to have to reconsider um, our, um, our sovereignty over Māori data. And, and in the same way as Indigenous data, I mean, Māori data is the same. It's um, anything about us, um, whether it's by us or about us. And I, I, you know, from a um, some people say, oh, but that's information, not data. But then I, I say, well, that's your Western perspective. We're, we're Indigenous peoples, and this is our definition. Um, we also, um, just last year, our Supreme Court, uh, the New Zealand Supreme Court, which is the highest court in New Zealand, um, ruled that um, traditional Māori knowledge is part of New Zealand common law. So that's further reinforced um, Māori data sovereignty rights in New Zealand. Um, and, and like many other countries, New Zealand signed up to the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which we also um, recognise um, as protecting our sovereignty over our data. Um, and we also have, just from that, um, the tribunal um, regarding our constitutional agreements, uh, we also have another claim of the intellectual property rights. Uh, it's called the Y262 claim. Um, so the, the current government is investing millions of dollars into um, seeking a solution from that um, tribunal hearing. So a lot of that tribunal hearing, again, reinforces the fact that Māori have sovereignty over their own data and over, yeah, basically anything digital. So I, I think, yeah, I, for us, yeah, Māori, I think we understand that we're very privileged in the fact that we do have some constitutional agreements. But saying that, it's still a fight. We the, the government doesn't fully cooperate with us. Uh, we still have to fight, and there's still division on um, 
various you know, translations of what is a treasure, what is sovereignty. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, so I, yeah, again, I will um, I will leave it there and yeah, maybe go back to Maggie and yeah, so thank you. Well, okay, thank you. So the world of, um, is changing in libraries and other uh, records collections in Australia. So in Australia, we have no treaty, as you know. There are a, a number of places where treaties are now being negotiated. Uh, in Victoria, where I'm currently working as a commissioner with the Uruk Justice Commission, uh, Australia's first Indigenous truth-telling commission, we have uh, tre treaty negotiations are well underway. So those of you in Victoria will uh, know this. We also know that um, the uh, new state of South Australia is in strong um, negotiations to establish treaty uh, legislation. And in Queensland, treaty legislation has recently passed through. So things are changing in Australia on the treaty front. I don't know how long it will take, um, how long it will be, but quite a while. But I want to point to you and just take an example of something which has changed recently. So uh, those of you in Queensland might be record, uh, aware of the report, uh, review of the Public Records Act 2002, which is just being completed. And so this is a very important uh, change that's happened because, uh, for, in the Indigenous data sovereignty space because for the first time, public records officers have now, have, in Queensland, have recognised the absolute criticality of public records for First Peoples. And in that review, they, uh, the government has now supported a whole lot of recommendations that actually go to that. So I'm going to talk about that and then I'm going to talk about the closing the gap and the data aspects of that. So in the, uh, the legislative changes uh, is the supporting the rights of they're going to change the purpose of the Public Records Act 2002 will be added to to support the rights of the pe uh, Indigenous people of Queensland. It also in implementing the Queensland government's commitment to the path of treaty or process give to give a new rec legislation that would afford due recognition to the special interests and needs of First Nations people in relation to Queensland's public records include evaluation of any potential for concepts of Indigenous data sovereignty, Indigenous data governance, and Indigenous cultural and intellectual property to contribute to meeting these special interests and needs. Now, but there's a whole lot more, and I won't go through those, but the critical thing is this is the first time we've had a government say these records are critical to First Peoples and First Peoples have a specific right that doesn't counter other people's rights, but actually has a unique, have a new, unique right in relation to these records, and they must include Indigenous data governance. So if you're working in a public records office, perhaps not in Queensland, have a think about your own act. Uh, I know in Victoria we're going to have to have changes to uh, the, inquire, uh, the act here in Victoria to actually allow us the records within your rook where Indigenous people have told us their story of injustice they have also set the protections that they want around the, those data, and we as a commission are instructed in our letters patent to preserve the sovereignty of First Peoples' knowledges, which we can keep safe while the commission is going, but in 2025 when the commission completes, all our records will have to go to the Public Records Office. So we need a change of legislation to make sure that those protections that people want for their own stories carry on into per perpetuity and don't run out in a few short years. The other thing I'll talk about is the closing the gap. So closing the gap, as most people in Australia will know, is the main framework that um, is around Indigenous policy. And we had 10 years of closing the gap, 2008 to 2018, where it was pretty clear that uh, of the six targets, I think only two of them were on track. None of them were done in over 10 years, didn't make any progress. So the re renewed closing the gap was actually a memorandum of understanding between the uh, Coalition of Peaks, or the first uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander key organisations, and the government. So we now have a new target, but it's built around four pillars, and pillar four is data. So in pillar four, it talks about 
the right of First Peoples to be able to access the data that they need for nation building. So it's there's two types, two arms to Indigenous data sovereignty, I guess. We've got governance of data where we want to assert our right to ensure that data about us are not misused and are not misused to cause further harm, which they certainly have in the past. And people do this without thinking. You know, it's not a deliberate thing most of the time. Um, but so much data about us is just used to paint a portrait of us as hopeless, helpless and hapless. Uh, and that just that's, that's the only Aborigine that most people in Australia know is the statistical Aborigine that they see across rivers of grog and all the other headlines, bad fathering, all the ones that they see across in the newspaper on a regular basis. The other side is the data for governance, and they're the records and data that we need and different nations need for nation rebuilding. And so Closing the Gap now has very strong um, changes in how Indigenous data are used within non-Indigenous institutions and how we can make sure that the communities that those data relate to actually have access to those data to use it for their own uh, beneficial purposes. So that also is coming to a data repository near you. So I'll stop there for a bit. Um, we might encourage some questions um, and hand it over, but if we can encourage some questions, that will be good because we don't want to just keep talking for an hour. We've got, we'd rather answer your questions. Right. Thanks, Maggie. So I, I think yeah, if I just um, start talking about um, artificial intelligence from a, a Maori perspective, so I, I'm actively lobbying and promoting the fact that um, AI is, you know, a potentially um, good tool that can empower Maori and decolonize our systems and our and our knowledge. But it will only do that if you know at the crossroads if we turn right and want the change. And so this is where the, the, um, the, the governance of data comes in. We actually need Māori to be working with government agencies, with the big data companies, and actually design um, you know, algorithms and how machine learning is working and um, artificial intelligence systems work. And then the, the risk is if we don't, um, I, I strongly believe we're, we're on the cusp of um, a, a new era of colonisation through artificial intelligence. So it's really important that we get on board now. Uh, one good aspect of the New Zealand government being very slow to um, consider AI is this gives Māori a chance to um, start preparing. Um, so I'm, I'm also lobbying that um, with all the new um, big tech companies that are coming to New Zealand with their data warehouses, um, that they should, um, the, the New Zealand government should be imposing upon them to, um, clauses to commit to our treaties and to commit to being good corporate citizens with the Indigenous peoples of New Zealand. So I, I think uh, much like other Indigenous peoples, Māori were overrepresented um, in the digital divide within New Zealand. Um, so I mean that's going to be one of the first issues that we have, one of the first hurdles. But I mean, I, I guess like uh, most other Indigenous peoples, we are overrepresented with all the negative stats um, in um, health and social and education, et cetera, et cetera. Not because we're bad people, but because of colonisation. And the um, governments around the world have been slow to um, recognise colonisation. And just on that, I saw today that the um, the king of, um, the, the Dutch king um, made a, um, a formal apology to, um, to the slave trade, to the descendants of the slave trade, which I thought was really important. Um, and you know we are in a you know the world is moving forward to understanding and um, yeah trying to rectify some of those colonisation issues. So um, for justice, for example, in New Zealand, Maori um, we are overrepresented in, in being incarcerated. Um, and there's a lot of um, research which suggests that the bias starts from the New Zealand police uh, with their lawyers and with people in the court system. So I, I would argue that if we have a, an AI designed for the justice system and it's co-designed with Māori, we will likely not have um, a biased AI and we will have, yeah, we'll, we'll see those rates for um, 
Māori being incarcerated dropping um, because of AI using non-biased data. Uh, the same with the health system. We already know that uh, Māori don't go to um, get health services until it's too late. Uh, they don't go see a doctor. Uh, there's plenty of research saying that once they do see a, a human doctor, there's, um, there's racism and there's bias, and it, that stops them from going back again. So again, I, I think there's, a, a, there's quite a few health um, you know, um, services which could be automated through AI. And as long as, you know, again, co-designed, we'll, I think we'll see a, a huge amount of um, uptake in um, the, the population health of all Māori. Um, also, there's also a lot of fear amongst our Māori communities that AI will um, automate a lot of the manual jobs that our people have. Um, so I'm, I'm suggesting that we need to start looking at what the future jobs are and then start upskilling in those areas. I, mean, I can imagine these conversations were happening when the motor, motor vehicles were first introduced and the blacksmiths would have been having all sorts of issues. But I mean, there's a whole new industry out there which we need to start considering. And I think, yeah, for, particularly for Māori, this is a, yeah, we're right at the stage where we need to do that. Um, as librarians, I, I think librarians are, are going to be um, playing a very crucial role in the future going forward with AI. Um, I've already seen um, a few um, emails online um, providing false narratives about um, traditional Māori knowledge and our creation stories. So, I mean, one example I keep on using, um, chat GPT uh, 3 and 4 basically gave me um, a, a creation story, which was not, it was written in Māori, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't Māori knowledge. It was basically a translation of different parts of the King James Bible and then inserting different Māori words to make it sound like it was our history. So I, I think as librarians and as um, knowledge workers, uh, I, I think there's probably a chance to reconsider um, implementing new metadata, new cataloging, because uh, we know that a lot of history books are, have false narratives, but they, they're, they're good to know that they exist. But of course, our AI um, machine learning doesn't recognize the difference between what's factually correct and what's not. So I, I think there, there's a, um, some considerations there for the, um, for the library and knowledge workers to consider. Um, yeah, so I'll just, yeah, I'll leave that there and pass it over. Thank you. So I'll, I'll just add a little bit to that and then I'll answer the um, first question on the chat. So yes, indeed, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, same as for Māori, we fear with AI will magnify the risks and the harms and the deficits that come, currently emanate from data. And also that we will not get the same benefits. So benefits do flow from AI, they do flow from all sorts of things, but as a disadvantaged, disenfranchised, marginalised community, we are unlikely to receive our fair share of the benefits. So that's where we sit. We're also very aware that algorithms, at least in the first instance, don't write themselves. They are not a whole lot of ones and zeros and whatever else. They are actually a socio-cultural human artefact. There is always a human at the start. And if that human, all humans hold biases, they hold values, they have ways of looking in the world, ways of understanding their own place in the world, those biases feed in or even those sort of um, they're not even biases sometimes, but they feed in to the algorithm and that's the world the algorithm creates. And usually within that world, because those people who are creating those algorithms are almost always non-first peoples, is where we cannot be anything except um, a problem to be solved. So if you think about all the data that feed in to you know all the big administrative data sets held by government agencies held by and now increasingly by big private agencies nearly so this actually feeds into the question that the person's asked me to speak about the statistical indigeny so this sort of feeds in so you've got and i will just talk about gdp before i do it um, we actually put in uh, indigenous data sovereignty into chat gpt and said you know please write us an essay and it did a pretty good job, actually. 
I had a dinner in about two minutes and I'm sort of thinking, what am I doing writing these books? It takes me months um, to, to write these chapters. But it was clear that because only a few people are writing, we could see bits of our own work and bits from the US uh, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network, bits from the Maori Data Sovereignty Network all woven in there. And because, like Gareth Taylor was saying, because there are so much negative stuff out there about us, that will be what is produced. I, I daren't ask it to write a, 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 an essay about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, parenthood, for example. I would be horrified to see what comes back. So we need to be very aware that these things, just because they're in algorithmic, just because they're in numeric form, do not make them more objective. In fact, they it makes their subjectivity even more dangerous because we can't see it. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, somebody's asked me to talk about the statistical indigeny. So if we think about, this is statistics data now, and usually population statistics. If we think around uh, statistics, population statistics, is what they are, there's a guy called Scott who's done a wonderful book uh, where he says that there are four things you really need if you are going to make a policy catastrophe of truly epic proportions. So the first thing you need for a policy catastrophe is a way of simplifying and ordering complex sociocultural and phenomena. And usually he said that's data, population level data. So you take complex things like um, schooling and education and all these things and you, you simplify it down so that it creates things in easily manageable and equal bite-sized bits. It does what, what statistics is meant to do. But the trouble is you then, and for Scott and for others, to say, well, what gets looked at, what gets collected, is then only the slice of Indigenous life that government is interested in. So they don't ask about our community functioning. They don't ask about um, how we care for children, how we interact between elders. They don't ask uh, about whether schools that have high rates of um, Aboriginal absenteeism actually have are culturally safe for those kids to go. None of those data are collected. Instead, it's really basic, simple stuff. How many kids are missing school? How many kids aren't uh, reaching level on that plan? How many people are in jail? How many people are dying young? How many people are unemployed? So if you think about all of those big data sets, you know, we probably won't have a census in 10 years. It'll all be just administrative data linked up to create profiles of everybody. But we are heavily overrepresented in all those negative categories that we're looking at. And the only data that collects, is collected about us is what government sees are our problems that have to be solved. So they keep collecting data about these same things all the time. If you doubt me, just Google um, Aboriginal statistics and see what comes up. All problems. The trouble is if you've only got problematic data, then it doesn't matter how big the ball of data is that you've got, then the only, only answer it can give of you when you ask about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander policy things is that we are the problem because it doesn't, they don't collect data about all the other things. So it's like Aboriginal people not going to school or missing school or not meeting uh, educational limits exist in a vacuum as if somehow it's all related to that Aboriginal child or that Aboriginal family or that Aboriginal community. But, of course, that's not the case. You know, all our families are so devastated. They're so traumatised. Um, we get praised for being resilient. I, I get really angry when people praise us for being resilient, as if it's so, it's so resilient. And you sort of say people are hanging on by their teeth and those people who don't, who lose that battle to be resilient, end up in jail or in mental health wards or dying early from drug and alcohol use. So... That's what I talk about, the statistical indigeny. If that's the only Aboriginal person that most Australians know, uh, I've, I've done some research on this myself, and 90% of average, of, I did a brand, participate, had a few questions in a national wide survey. 90% of non Indigenous Australians do not actually know any Aboriginal people. And most of that 10% that did know 
only knew them through work, so as clients, rather than as friends, neighbours, family. So if you don't know any Aboriginal people, then the only portrait you will get of Aboriginal people is what is presented to you in the national narrative, and that is deeply harmful. And AI risks making that view even more embedded. So I'll hand over now and uh, can ask another question. Ant Thank you. I'll try and answer the Indigenous data governance processes work. So I'm just going to use the term Māori uh, simply because in New Zealand, um, the, the term Māori is recognised in New Zealand legislation um, and it gives us legal rights. And um, so um, we've got um, one positive example of uh, Māori data governance. Um, so in New Zealand, pretty much like Australia, we have um, birth certificates. So the, the previous registrar of births, deaths and marriages, who's in charge of birth certificates, um, had, this, had this idea that it would be really good to um, add people's um, tribal, iwi tribal affiliations to uh, people's birth certificates. Um, so um, basically, he started uh, going public saying, this is, yeah, this is what we're going to do. It's such a great idea. And then he got quite a lot of backlash because um, Maori didn't ask for it. Yet, yeah, so um, so then um, the process um, engaged through a, a Māori data governance um, process. Um, so um, a independent advisor or a, an advisory group of tribal representatives was established. And uh, I was brought on as an independent um, Māori data sovereignty expert. And so uh, what happened was that we um, ascertained that it is a good idea to put tribal data onto a birth certificate, but that despite what an individual might want to add to their birth certificate, it doesn't mean it's authoritative unless the tribe um, says that it's um, authoritative. So um, that, that's quite important because otherwise anybody could have said they were from this tribe and that tribe and um, yeah, and it would have been government sanctioned as opposed to tribal, tribally sanctioned. So that's... Um, so that paper got taken to our parliament and approved by cabinet. And so the next steps are um, co-designing um, a new data system that will work for all the tribes, who, so all the tribes can have access to the tribal data and they can verify it against their own data. Um, and, we, and if the tribe disagrees with the individual, that's fine. The individual will still have the tribal data on their birth certificate but they won't be recognised by the tribe. Um, so I think that that's one really significant um, aspect of um, Māori data um, governance. And it's also important to point out, we're still very new to, um, it was only a few years ago that Māori data sovereignty was recognised in New Zealand. So we are still got a way to go. Um, I, I can give you some warnings. Um, it, the government is very good at handpicking um, voices of uh, Māori, um, which I, yeah, I guess is quite common to all Indigenous peoples. So the, the, the risk is that, um, and it has happened in the past, is the government will select um, a few people and claim that as consultation. And some of the um, issues have been quite dire. So in New Zealand, we have a, an algorithm charter. Uh, one of the issues, uh, one of the purposes of the algorithm charter was to protect Māori um, from discrimination and to respect our constitutional documents. Um, so, I mean, that I, I think it was 2018 that um, the charter came out um, and it was being so heavily criticised that, um, yeah, I mean, it, it needs a review because, it, you know, it doesn't, I mean, on paper, it, it sounds really amazing, it sounds like it's protective, it sounds like Māori data governance will take place and algorithms will be unbiased, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, in fact, quite the opposite. And we've, we've seen that with um, the, some of the signatories. Uh, we've seen uh, proposals for facial recognition. We've seen um, racist um, algorithms being created that will discriminate, discriminate against Māori for living traditional values as opposed to going to a university, for example. 
So there's some, some issues there. Uh, we also have examples of, um, I think there's two government departments in New Zealand so far have signed formal agreements with some of our larger Māori data sovereignty um, groups. And so they've committed to Māori data governance. But again, it's still very early, so it's hard to give full details, but perhaps the census is one example. Um, our previous census failed Māori. It, well, it was, yeah, it failed a lot of people for a number of reasons. So there's been a, a Māori data governance agreement in place of stats, and we have seen um, improvements in our um, stats um, in that census start of this year. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that was the other question to answer. So um, maybe I'll hand back to Maggie. Thank you. Um, I've, I've put some um, uh, resources in the, the chat. So we've got the original uh, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Towards an Agenda that's um, um, edited by the wonderful Tahu Kukatai and uh, John Taylor, who's also pretty amazing. So that book is free to download from the ANU Press website. And that book came out of our original Indigenous Data Sovereignty meeting that we held in Canberra which had people from all over the Kansas countries, especially. Um, and of course, we, we've all experienced Anglo colonisation. So we are quite, um, we, we have a lot of similarities when it comes to Indigenous data and also with the government departments and the way they're shaped when we have to deal with data sovereignty issues. There's also Indigenous data sovereignty and policy, which is came out in 2020. We actually bought the data rights for that amongst the editors um, because our, our purpose is to make sure that people have access to this. So if you go into the, the chap that book's Palgrave Macmillan website, you can actually download different um, chapters for free. And also our own Mayam Nairi Wingara, uh, Ella, that's how you say it, um, is our website has a lot of stuff on there as well if you want to go and learn more. Um, I'm not sure what else there is to say. I know in Australia we um, we we have we don't have anywhere near as much. We have not been officially the gov governments are, are grappling, uh, state and federal, with indigenous data sovereignty, and most of the time making a when they do engage, making a fairly good go of it. Uh, I know I've recently sat still sitting, I think. Um, on a group um, where government, because of closing the gap pillar four, are now looking at how they deal with administrative data from government departments. And there is a framework that's just about close to be being released. It's not perfect by any means, but it is the first time that uh, Australian government departments have recognised that they need to do something differently with Indigenous data. And of course, the big risk with all of this is that AI, big data, comes along with open data. So there is a big push to make within universities, within government departments, everywhere, to make all data open. So there is a belief that has some uh, rationality to it, but not a lot, that somehow opening up all data to anybody who wants will give you more solutions. But if we go back to my example before, that if all you've got is that big ball of negative data, then that's the only answer you can get. So there is a big push to make all these departments' administrative data sets open. And in fact, in 2022, uh, the Australian Parliament passed, passed the uh, Data Availability and Transparency Act, which provides a legislative basis for opening these data sets up. Despite promises to us that they would include protections for Indigenous data, that was not done. And in fact, the whole bill does not even contain the word Indigenous or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander anywhere. So, you know, this is the reality versus the, the rhetoric is that we get talk about protections. But, you know, the risk of opening up our data to people who do not understand the context, um, you know, you might be a whole group of interested uh, researchers from Germany. And we know that as Indigenous peoples, we often become a research curiosity. 
And what everybody wants to do is compare us to the non-Indigenous population. So that's very simplistic. And I'd ask you just to think about it that a little bit too, um, that the non-Indigenous population, we are always compared, we are always raced as Indigenous peoples, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. The non-Indigenous population is the, uh, is the group that's named by the race that is not. So really what they're doing is they're comparing us to normal people. And but they're only comparing us uh, across certain uh, dimensions. That go back to that Scott, that small slice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander life that go the government finds um, interesting. And indeed, Scott's second factor that he says you, you absolutely need if you're going to have um, a policy disaster of truly epic proportions is to then have a belief in technology. Now, he was writing in 1998, so he didn't know about AI or big data or any of these things, but he was talking about the sort of ideology belief around the sort of those technological solutions. And so that's what we have with open data uh, and open big data. The third and the fourth thing for is a, a population that doesn't have the power um, to be able to stop now, uh, the way policy is imposed on it, and absolutely that's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And the fourth is a state that is willing to use coercion um, to impose its own policy solutions. And, of course, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that has been uh, what has happened to us since, um, since colonisation. So we know we've had 200 years of policy failure we know we have to do it differently, but there is just huge resistance to doing it differently. And my fear is that AI and big data and open data will just, as Karatiana said before, it will just be a new era of colonisation. So I, I fear, I do have genuine fear, and um, I'm not sure what we can do except what we are doing um, to try and slow this down and have governments actually think this through clearly to make sure they don't do more harm than good. We might want some more questions. Yeah, one's just come through. Um, there's one from earlier um, that says, um, given how biased much of the existing data that may be used to train AI is and how unresponsive the Facebooks and Googles of the world are, plus how any government grovels to these companies, how can we help in trying to ensure that AI can be used positively? And I'm just going to add my own little question onto that as well. Are you aware of any companies that are actively trying to engage First Nations in this area? Maybe I'll just jump on. <laughs> um, so I, I think from a New Zealand perspective, there are at least two of the large conglomerates engaging with Māori. Um, I, I don't want to mention them because I, but I, yeah, I, I'm independent and very neutral. But and I also don't know how genuine that engagement will be in the future. But they're, they're certainly, yeah, that's certainly occurring at the very early stages. Um, but. I think in terms of um, yeah the biased data with those big companies, I, for me, I mean, for my opinion, for New Zealand, for Māori, I, we need the government actually needs to um, get to the forefront. And I think I said it before, and actually say, you know, if you want to bring your data, your you know your data warehouses here, here's what you need to do. Um, well, here's our commitment to, to yeah, the treaty, um, and we'd like you to tell us how you will honour that. And then we'd like to review that every couple of years. Um, I also think that, I mean, we, as um, uh, international population, we, we're seeing hate crimes and um, all minorities being discriminated against online. Uh, we're seeing the uh, false media, and I think this is a really good opportunity for um, all governments to say, well, how do we address the harms caused, and then. Um, and also, how do we address the Indigenous rights issue and put it all into one category? So in New Zealand, we have a, um, a legislated body called NetSafe. Um, they, their role is to um, 
basically offer protection mechanisms. Um, so I, I'd like to see their role increased more and obviously more funding to um, try and um, ensure that um, Indigenous rights are being recognised in New Zealand. I also think that um, this is a, creates a bit of division, but I, I strongly believe that AI needs to be regulated and it needs to be regulated very quickly. Um, I also um, strongly believe that we need um, a number of our current laws in New Zealand need to be um, updated to reflect AI. Um, things like we have a Bill of Rights Act, a Human Rights Act, uh, we have um, intellectual property rights laws, which are way out of date already. I, they need to also be um, considered uh, for AI. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, th there's a, a lot of work our governments need to do and they have the authority and power to do. And I, I think if globally all of our governments um, kind of you know push these big companies together, we might end up with some results. And so and just going back to the, um, the um, Indigenous gov data governance question before, I, I missed out quite a vital um, fact for New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand, we currently have the, the government's currently consulting on consumer data, um, the right of um, consumers having access to their own data with like banks and um, retail and conglomerates. So a, a large part of that consultation um, talks about um, indigenous or Maori governance and Maori data sovereignty issues. So uh, that's another positive aspect of um, govern Maori governance in New Zealand. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just hand back over to Maggie. Thank you. I, look, there's a question about traditional knowledge labels and um, do, do I know about them or do we know about them and do we think libraries uh, should be using them? So the answer is yes and yes. So, yes, I do know about traditional knowledge labels. So anybody who doesn't, just Google traditional knowledge labels and go to the local context site uh, and you will see this group of 16 labels. Now, these labels, uh, and they do have significant Indigenous inputs into them, um, these labels were developed in the US and they were developed for libraries and museums. So they were developed to make sure if you've, uh, museums, malls and libraries, but they're still applicable in both. Uh, there is also labels around um, uh, bio, uh, bio specimens as well. But what they do is that they actually label things that are in their data meta tag, so they're attached to um, the, the electronic version of that um, item, and they give a provenance and they give whatever the people who are actually the owners of that item are, they can write their own protocols around how that's to be used. So they talk about things. So if you, you look, go to the local context website, um, they talk about things like uh, songs and other things that are uh, in libraries that were recorded a long time ago from uh, people who have now long passed. And that's something that's particularly um, emotive for me because as Palawa, the only recording we have of our language is um, a recording that was made in the late 1890s of Fanny Cochran Smith, um, Aboriginal woman, uh, singing um, a song, singing a, a Palawa song. But, of course, we don't have that. That's held in a museum. So... The idea of a traditional knowledge label, it would be that you would attach this label. You would say that it has uh, uh, cultural, the 16 of them, I can't remember, it's sort of women's business, men's business, um, uh, seasonal. There's all sorts of um, aspects that might be, but mostly it's about provenance. So it's to talk about how it was taken, who it belongs to, rather than it be recorded under the name of the guy that took it because at the moment the entry is him. So, yes, I would encourage you, if you're in a library, go in and have a look at the local context site and see if it's something, because they're not, it's not, it doesn't cost you any money. These labels are pretty, um, no, I need to take a step back. 
traditional knowledge labels can only be applied, the information on can only be applied by the people who own the data. So you can't go through all your collection and attach all these data labels and get all excited. You need to actually go back to those people who own it. But you can put on notices. So you can stick on traditional knowledge notices that is an institutional recognition, a meta tag, that says this is a First Peoples item. Um, we have linked it to these First Peoples. Those First Peoples have yet not told us what the protocols and things are around this item. And some people might go back and say, remove it from your collection or close it down. We, we do not want this to be made available. So I can't explain traditional knowledge labels just like that, but they're, they're worth a look if you're in a library and I think they are being used throughout the world. The, the Library of Congress uses traditional knowledge labels and I think, um, I think they could work well in Australia as well. Thank you, Ella, for putting the uh, link up to local context. I, I see a, a new comment here about what strategies to attract. So just from a, a Maori perspective, so this, this, this is probably a little bit radical for librarians, but I, I think it's important to understand that, you know, quite often a, a library has um, our knowledge and going to the library is not always accessible or always culturally safe. And for, you know, there's some discussions in New Zealand at the moment with tribal communities that, why don't we have our own libraries with our own information and our own museums, our own archives? So I, I think, yeah, I think it's important just to be aware that there are some of those feelings. Um, but I, my, my experience with you know uh, libraries in yeah in my local area has been positive, but I think yeah, but I have heard of other stories where it's not so positive outside of my local area. So I, I think. Um, yeah, just being aware that you know you you are actually the new knowledge holders, the, the the guardians of something that was either taken by stealth, by force, or shared um, by our, our ancestors, or by you know it's our traditional knowledge there, and then trying to be respectful of that, and then I, I think yeah, and then trying to um, I mean I know there's there's, there's a, a few librarians. On this course, uh, in this call, who I've worked with in the past, who've done amazing um, biocultural work, they've done amazing um, cultural safety work, and I, I think just being um, ensuring that your um, physical libraries are, are culturally inviting and culturally safe go a long way. Right, thanks. I, I would agree. Uh, libraries. Um not intentionally, but have always been fairly um, alien places for First Peoples. Um, and, and most First Peoples are pretty aware that so much of our knowledge is tied up in special collections and other things, things that are written about us that we can't access. So um, accessibility. Um, so, for example, I'll give you an example of, of accessibility. So a few years ago, for my sins, I was Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous at the University of Tasmania. And one of the things we had in our special collections in the library was a genealogy um, that was um, Bill Mollison had done in the early 1970s, where he had tracked, and I talked about those nine women, he had tracked the contemporary Aboriginal population back to those nine women. He did it as a PhD, amazing bit of work. And I can remember I was a kid at the time. Well, I wasn't that <laughs> young, but my dad was involved in, you know, Bill would reach out and just talk to people and he uh, talked to my dad and sort of, you know, track back our family and all the, then passed on to other people. So it's a really good, and basically we all come from three family groups. My family up the Briggs, up in the Northwest, the Fanny Cochran Smith that I talked about made the this, the recording in the southeast and the groups of families who were in the on the islands. And we all come from the northeast of Tasmania because that's where everybody, all the women were kidnapped from. It was nice and convenient to the sealing islands. So that was up there and it was inaccessible. So people people would come to me and they say, Oh, 
I think I'm a member of your family, but I'm not entirely sure. You know, it's 50 years since this was collected. And I could normally say, well, tell me what your grandmother's name is and I'll tell you whether you are. But that seems silly when there was this big genealogy and Mollison did hand out copies, but, of course, 1974, so it was all just, you know, those old photocopies where you had to cut the paper. Um, and I had an old one that was been in our, our family, but none of it. But So what I did was I got it digitised. I had the power to get the whole thing digitised, but then to had to make it available only to Aboriginal people. So the idea was to say to somebody, look, if you really want to trace your family connections and you're not 100% sure how you fit in here, because we've gone from nine women to 12, 15,000, go to the library, make a booking, let them know that you're an Abri you think you're an Aboriginal person and that you want to have access to these genealogies. So that's now been enacted. So it, it's a careful thing of making sure people get access to the information they need without opening up what are precious to us, our genealogies, uh, back we're nearly all descended from Manalagena because four of his daughters were part of those nine women, um, without opening that up for it to be extracted and taken away and written up somewhere and circulated on the internet and just abused. So it's always a fine line. So think about what you've got in your libraries and think about who 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 owns it and who should have access to it and how you can do that safely. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any last questions, we've still got about five minutes or so um, with our lovely presenters, so put them in the chat. Um, but otherwise, I just wanted to let everybody know, hold on, um, that... Um, in lieu of a physical gift um, to recognise the contribution of our speakers for this whole um, conference, Ansredge will be making a donation to The Torch, um, which is an organisation Maggie brought to our attention. Um, the Torch provide art, cultural and arts industry support to Indigenous offenders and ex-offenders in Victoria. Um, so if you'd like to make your own donation, you're welcome to. That QR code will take you to the donation page um, and you're very welcome to make your own donation as well. Um, but I don't see oh, there's I don't think there's any final questions. Um, but yes, um, the committee and everybody in the community would like to thank both of you very much for your time. Um, it's been very enlightening and um, a great discussion, I think. Yeah. Thanks for listening to us. Find out more. Yes, <laughs> we definitely will. Thank you very much.